This is the last of a five episode series meant to go over two proposals to make new buildings cleaner and more energy efficient. Thanks for continuing on. My name is Hugo Wong and I work at the Building and Safety Standards Branch, the part of the government of British Columbia responsible for building codes and standards. Over the last four episodes, I've gone over some proposed changes to the BC Building Code designed to make new buildings cleaner and more energy efficient. Like the introduction of the Energy Step Code, people involved in the building sector have told us that concrete examples, case studies, and best practice guidelines have been really helpful when introducing new building code options and requirements. In this last episode, I want to go over some suggestions and recommendations that have been co-developed with partners in various sectors, including people from the construction industry, local planning and building departments, developers of market and non-market buildings, academia, and more. These are not strict rules, just recommendations designed to increase the chances of a smooth rollout for everyone involved. They're also based heavily on lessons learned through the rollout of the Energy Step Code, which began in 2017. Since this presentation is being made before the new building code requirements have been implemented, I'll keep this guidance general and say that any recommendations may change slightly as everyone gains experience. More detailed guidance will come from a variety of sources in the future. As of summer 2022, some local governments incentivize low carbon energy systems by lowering step code requirements. For example, some local governments require the top step for all buildings, but allow a building to meet a slightly lower step if a low carbon energy system like an electric heat pump is installed. The proposed building code change would let local governments require, not just incentivize, lower carbon construction in their communities. The caveat is that they would have to use the provincial approach, as any existing technical building requirements that conflict with the BC Building Code will have no force or effect. Technical building requirements are not incentives, which explains why a relaxation type approach is still available. Given these proposed code changes in the short term, it's helpful to take a broader view and look at the long-term goals we've set. The first goal is to make buildings net zero energy ready by 2032. In general, this means new buildings built on or after 2032 will use about 80% less energy than a base code building today. To quickly recap that definition, a net zero energy ready building is one that has been designed and built to a level of performance such that it could, with the addition of on-site renewable energy technologies, achieve net zero energy performance. To further clarify, net zero energy ready refers to the energy consumed by the building and does not account for transmission losses before the gas or electrical meter of the building. These energy efficiency requirements, which are called the BC Energy Step Code, started as a local government opt-in. But energy efficiency requirements are planned to increase province-wide in 2022 and 2027, which gradually transitions industry towards the net zero energy ready endpoint. The second goal is for zero carbon new construction by 2030. As with energy efficiency, it's intended to start as a local government opt-in. Pollution limits for new buildings are expected to get more stringent in 2024 and 2027, which gradually transitioned industry towards that zero carbon endpoint. Just like with energy, zero carbon new construction for us means a building that does not emit carbon after construction. As mentioned previously, you'll see throughout the code proposals that the phrase zero carbon ready rather than zero carbon is in there. They're not different goals, they just acknowledge the activities governed by the building code. Building codes regulate buildings, not the energy sources that go into them. Utility providers and other parts of government are responsible for requiring and supplying lower carbon fuels to these buildings. In short, we as building code writers make buildings ready for zero carbon fuel, whereas utility providers and other parts of government ensure that zero carbon fuel is there to finish the job. So the plan includes on-site renewable energy like solar for a portion of the energy consumption that's factored in too. We've released a short best practices bulletin for reducing greenhouse gases and new construction, which you can access by clicking the link in the slide presentation. Over the last five years, STEPCO communities have earned lots of experience implementing higher energy efficiency standards. Builders, developers, and local governments have been through that process, and there are some common keys to success, which we encourage local governments to consider as we consider rolling out an opt-in carbon pollution standard. Regional consistency is a big driver of success. If like-minded, neighboring local governments collaborate on a timeline and policy approach, not only does that save staff time, it reduces confusion for builders who work in multiple communities. Common timelines and deadlines, forms and processes on both sides of the permit desk save everyone time and effort. 
For example, we encourage communities to use the provincial compliance forms and calculators, which provide a consistent way of reporting energy performance. We are updating both the Part 9 and Part 3 compliance forms to reflect any changes made to energy efficiency and emissions requirements. However, we also recognize that different communities have different goals and needs. That's why the opt-in exists. A community that is ready uh, with green building materials and expertise can move at a different pace, and that's okay. Communities that want to build capacity can again reach out to a similar community nearby to collaborate, which can save time and effort. Regarding capacity, it's also important to set industry up for success by first consulting with them to hear any concerns they have and then provide training and advance notice, which will help smooth the rollout of any new requirement or incentive. Finally, I alluded to this earlier, but efficient, realistic processes can make things easier for the busy people in local governments and industry. Common forms, clear requirements, and the right balance between accountability and efficiency will be mutually beneficial. If you've made it this far into the presentation and feel a little bit overwhelmed, it's okay. It's a lot of information, so take a break, talk to your colleagues about what you heard, and get those initial reactions. If you need help making a to-do list, here's a start. Review the guidance documents, which I'll summarize in the next slide. Consult with industry and gauge their readiness. This process was used when the Energy Step Code was first launched in 2017, and it proved to be a really useful mutual learning experience where everyone can take ownership of meeting the targets. This could include breakfast events, webinars, email blasts, in-person training, or printed documentation. Templates and suggestions are online alongside the other guidance documents. Compliance and approvals processes may also need to be updated, including new forms. Communities that want to require lower building emissions may wish to consider thermal conditioning permitting to verify compliance with modeled systems and emissions assumptions. There are local governments who've started making simple forms and processes for these, and common forms make everything easier for everyone. So reach out to the Step Code Peer Network to get started. Speaking of the Step Code Peer Network, they will be a great resource and can connect you to like-minded local staff or resources. To help track progress, we are urging communities interested in regulating emissions from buildings to contact the peer network when they start consultation. This PowerPoint is meant to be an introduction to policy objectives, so there are other written materials that go into specifics for those who need them. Read them for more information. But I'll go over the main points quickly here. In general, projects in progress with building permits submitted under a previous building code should adhere to that previous code. At this stage, we are providing early guidance on energy and greenhouse gas modeling, but a more defined rule set will be established shortly. The written material also includes some guidance on how to approach high electrical extension fees and district energy systems. Since any base building code changes affect what goes on at the local level, I want to start with outlining some typical local scenarios and how they might change or stay the same when new requirements come into effect. These are just examples, but may give you insight into your own situation. I should also say that these recommendations should not be taken as legal advice, so please consult with your own counsel as necessary. Community A uses the base BC building code, or requires step one or two for part nine buildings and step one for part three buildings. This hypothetical community also does not have incentives for low carbon energy systems in buildings. Just as today, any changes to BC building code minimum requirements apply to all communities that use it, regardless of whether or not those changes are already referenced in local bylaws. So, if the code requires buildings to be 20% more efficient than previously, buildings in Community A will need to meet that requirement. It will just happen automatically. If there are no references to the BC Energy Step Code in local bylaws, no changes will be required. If communities require Step 1 or 2 for Part 9 buildings, or Step 1 for Part 3 buildings, these bylaws will have no force or effect when the base building code changes. If communities incentivize steps one or two, or step one for part three buildings, they should review whether those incentives are still necessary. Those communities may also, if they choose, reduce greenhouse gases from new construction by requiring or incentivizing one of the carbon levels in the provincial carbon pollution standard. However, a six to 12 month notice period for local industry is strongly recommended, depending on the stringency of the carbon requirements being considered. More on this in a little bit. Let's move on to hypothetical Community B. Community B requires Part 9 buildings to meet Step 3 and Part 3 buildings to meet Step 2. 
They're also considering incentives or requirements for lower emission buildings, but haven't implemented anything yet. When the new code comes into effect, builders can simply go on as usual for the most part, because the local requirements and the minimum code requirements would be the same or similar. However, it would be worth it for builders to review the final code language, as there will be some small changes that may affect them, as described in the previous episodes. Local governments that require Step 3 for Part 9 buildings or Step 2 for Part 3 buildings may want to revisit their bylaws and policies, depending on their particular wording or situation. For example, if implementation dates don't align with provincial ones. As with Community A, communities with incentives for Step 3 for Part 9 or Step 2 for Part 3 may need to revisit whether it's worth retaining those incentives since it will be the new provincial minimum. On the carbon side, communities may also, if they choose, reduce greenhouse gases from new construction by requiring or incentivizing a level of the building carbon pollution standard. However, a consultation period with local industry is strongly recommended. One last example is Community C. It requires Part 9 buildings to meet Step 5 and applicable Part 3 buildings to meet Step 4 with a relaxation to a lower step if the building uses a low carbon energy system like an electric heat pump. As Community C's local requirements are more stringent than the proposed minimum energy efficiency requirements, they're going to be unaffected. In this example, the community relaxes the step code requirements if a low carbon energy system is installed. And that relaxation will not be affected by the building code change as it continues to meet the code requirements of 20% better energy efficiency. The new provincial building carbon pollution standard does not affect the authority of local governments to incentivize such systems unless it also sets conflicting technical building requirements. If you've made it to the end, thanks so much for sticking it out. Just a few more things before we wrap up. Now that you've heard it all, you may have more questions about the details. I'd encourage you to look through all the written materials available online at gov.bc.ca slash building codes, which may address these questions. The Building and Safety Standards Branch will hold a live Q&A session to answer questions, and the date will be listed on gov.bc.ca slash building codes, so mark that in your calendars. Your trade association or industry representation may also hold information sessions specific to your needs, so look out for those. You can also email questions to building.safety at gov.bc.ca. Given the expected high volume of inquiries, we may not respond to individual messages, but we can aim to address the most common questions. After all that, submit your feedback to building.safety at gov.bc.ca and we'll follow up if we have any additional questions about your feedback. We're hoping to have the final code language signed into regulation at the end of 2022, subject to ministerial approval. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.